everyone, welcome. This is the afternoon session in the Vermont House of Representatives, the Committee on Education on January 14th, 2021. And we are continuing our listening uh, to uh, how, how are we, do, how are our school districts? Mm -hmm. And we've heard from the superintendents, the principals, we've heard some from school boards, and now we're gonna hear from some teachers. And with that, I welcome um, Don Tinney, who is currently the president of the Vermont National Education Association. So welcome, Don. Thank you. Thank Our, you, Chair uh, Webb. As, as I've said to others, pulling forth the, the Maasai question, how are the children? <laughs> Great. Well, good, ap good afternoon. And for the record, I am Don Tinney, a 31-year veteran English teacher from South Harrow. And as Chair Webb said, currently serving as president of Vermont NEA. And thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, thank you for serving on this most important committee. I'm very happy that I'll be joined by three colleagues from the field this afternoon, Chris Gurro, Stephanie Miller, and Larry O'Connor. And of course, you have also a person uh, from the field and Representative Brady. And sincerely appreciate how your committee has consistently sought to hear the educator's voice during your deliberations. Throughout the legislative session, you'll also be hearing from our executive director, Jeff Fannin, and our political director, Colin Robinson, who with great expertise represent our members while they are busy working at school. And Jeff and Colin, as you know, they're the folks who know which bill number is, is which. As many of you know, Vermont NEA represents over 12,000 educators in every corner of the state who are organized in local affiliates with their own governance structure. We are affiliated with the National Education Association, which is the largest labor union in the nation with over 3 million members. I am beyond proud to represent our extraordinary Vermont educators who have never stopped working to meet the needs of their students since the onset of this pandemic. Our members per put forth Herculean efforts in adapting to remote learning last March to continue providing instruction and engaging their students so they would feel as if they still belong to the school community. Our food service workers, paraeducators and school bus drivers went above and beyond the call of duty to provide nutritious meals to students and their families. <clears throat> if COVID-19 has taught us anything, it is how important schools are in providing a nutrition lifeline to the children and youth of Vermont which is why our organization will continue to promote the implementation of universal school meals in every community. Educators know that hungry children cannot learn. Feeding all of our children is an integral part of educating our children and youth. This is just one true indicator of why the public school is the bedrock of every community. Seeing how important schools are in providing essential services to our students and their families during the pandemic affirms our vision for the development of the community school model. And I know you'll be hearing more about that from Representative James, and we thank her for her support of our, the, that approach. As essential workers on the front line, our educators have been going to work every day providing direct instruction and support to students in their classrooms and to students learning virtually at home. The hybrid models, which I am sure you have heard about, have allowed schools to maintain proper physical distancing and other safety protocols, but they have nearly doubled the workload of our teachers since they must plan and implement lessons for both the physical classroom and the virtual classroom. While students may not be learning every lesson in our traditional curriculum, they continue to learn new lessons on a daily basis and have had to acquire executive skills that they would not have ordinary, ordinarily learned until later in life. Our support personnel, including custodial and maintenance staff, school bus drivers, paraeducators, administrative assistants, and food service workers continue to put themselves at risk on the front lines in service to their students and their families. When we consider the health risks and the chronic unpredictability that our members have been enduring since last March, we can easily understand why they have been experiencing levels of stress and anxiety as never before. 
Our educators have always been focused on the social emotional well being of their students. And in these tumultuous days, we have been reminding them to focus on their own social emotional well being. From being in meetings with folks from the Vermont Department of Mental Health, I know they share our concerns for the mental health of both our students and our education workforce. We must continue to work at banishing the stigma associated with mental health issues and do whatever we can to make sure the resources are available to provide counseling and other services to our students and our educators. In the spring of 2019, through a grant from the National Education Association, Vermont NEA convened a summit of nearly 200 education stakeholders to discuss trauma-sensitive practices in our approach to creating safe, compassionate schools. Our work has continued in this area, and over this last summer, we hosted a webinar series with David Melnick of the Northeastern Family Institute, who discussed adverse childhood experiences, resiliency, and how we can shift our mindset about student behavior. We received additional funding from our national organization to work with our New England counterparts and a regional approach incorporate to this work, incorporating a train the trainer model and other ideas about how we can make this work sustainable over time and across all school districts. This is not work that can be accomplished by sending individual educators off to a workshop or holding one in service training. In the virtual setting and in the classroom, we must continue to address the trauma our students and educators have experienced and pay particular attention to the minority trauma our BIPOC and marginalized students have experienced. We must continue to do everything we can to make sure every school is a sanctuary for every student. All the additional protocols and programmatic adjustments demanded by the pandemic have dramatically changed the school day. And our educators, as do all Vermonters, long for the day when we can return to what we used to call a normal routine. We share the aspirational goal of our state leaders to return to full-time in-person learning, but only when it is safe for students and for the education workforce. While learning has continued throughout the pandemic, remote learning is not an effective substitute for in-person learning where students experience daily human interactions with their educators and peers. Since returning to full-time in-person instruction is a top priority, then protecting the health of the education workforce through vaccinations must also be a top priority. Since last March, our members have not only been busy planning their own lessons and rewriting their curriculum, They've also been involved with local committees in implementing the state's health and safety guidelines and other protocols related to the pandemic. Over 20 of our members joined our Vermont NEA statewide task force on the safe reopening of schools to address issues related to our return to the classroom. For example, we have addressed not just the health and safety concerns of riding a school bus, but also the important equity issues related to school transportation. Before the start of school, the task force hosted virtual town halls with Dr. Mark Levine, Dr. Brina Holmes, Dr. William Raska, and Dr. Benjamin Lee to disseminate up-to-date medical information to our members and answer as many questions as possible. They have also met with Secretary French to share their concerns and to hear his perspective on reopening. They continue to meet to address health and safety concerns and most recently hosted a webinar with industrial hygienists affiliated with the National Education Association to explore the issues related to ventilation in our school buildings. Air quality will continue to be an issue we need to address during the pandemic and beyond. We greatly appreciate the General Assembly's support of HVAC inspections and upgrades in the last session. As educators, we never thought we'd be learning so much about HVAC systems, epidemiology, physical distancing, and the difference between viral droplets and aerosols. But the learning curve has been steep and interesting. Vermont NEA continues to be the premier source of professional development for educators in Vermont, and our professional programs director and her committee adapted quickly to the virtual world and the need for new approaches 
to teaching remotely. Learning is at the core of what we do. Our educators cherish the time they spend with their students and are the adults in their young lives outside of their immediate family who know them best. They know how their students learn and through ongoing and formal assessment, know what interventions and supports they need. Our educators will need additional resources to support their students as they address the unfinished learning from this pandemic. They will need dedicated planning time within their local districts to develop long-term strategies to assist our students and their families re to recover from this pandemic. Vermont educators are up for that challenge driven and sustained by their love and commitment for their students. Thank you for listening. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or we could wait to have questions after other folks have presented. And I see that Stephanie is here, so thank you. I think it's working well to just make sure that we get to hear from everybody and our members are, are holding their questions. But so do remember if you have a question members for someone specific or general, that would be great. So I would like to welcome Stephanie Miller, who's an elementary school teacher for the Colchester School District. And uh, we are very interested in hearing how things are going in the period of COVID. So welcome, Stephanie. Uh, thank you. So I am a uh, fifth grade teacher in Colchester. This is my 21st, 22nd year. I'm starting to lose count, which says a lot at this point, I guess. Um, and I would say um, things are okay. And I say things are okay because I, um, for those of you who are here when I testified in the spring, um, we were kind of in this place that we had never been before. And now I feel like we've done that about three different times in the course of this year, um, where the change is so often and um, so extreme that at, at least now we know, okay, we're just going to roll with the punches and we're going to figure it out. Um, to give you an idea, I've done things this, even this year that I never dreamed I would do. I actually... Um, rearranged my classroom three different times, you know, put desks in, put tables out, uh, use plexiglass, get rid of the plexiglass. Um, and then to make it work, I actually changed my classroom space where it was physically located in the building over the course of the weekend um, in November so that I could actually safely house the 23 students I had at the time. I have never moved my classroom <laughs> in the middle of a school year. And um, it takes actually about two weeks of Walkers work. Walkers and bikers, Artist Smith. Walkers and bikers, Artist Smith, to the front lobby. Sorry, now we know where you are. <laughs> Eight is dismissed to room 200. Um, and that's, I wasn't the only one. There were actually three teachers who moved over the course of that weekend that were classroom teachers. And we put, um, like I took over the music room um, so I could have a bigger space. It's actually a classroom and a half. Um, that was monumental. Um, it, so it takes two weeks usually to move a classroom. I worked for 20 hours over the course of the weekend with my 15 year old son, who is very well trained working in a teacher's classroom. And um, we managed to pull it together. Those are the types of things that take huge pieces of who you are. Um, and it, it takes a huge amount of energy because our classrooms are really the spaces that create safe, a safe haven for our kids. And everything we do is, is made of a choice to make it so that kids want to be there, they want to learn, they have the things they need. So anytime you have to change the makeup of your room, that takes a, a huge amount of effort and thought and energy. Um, and I think that's what this year has been about. Teachers are doing everything in their, and they're using their Herculean powers all the time to change to whatever the latest um, direction is. And at this point I can say, you know, every day we're like, why am I so tired? Like I'm exhausted, tired all the time because change is, is good, change on this level. Um, is, is really hard to do all the time. And so all of the school staff personnel 
from our cafeteria workers who have done all of this changing and how they prepare food and give it to our kids, you know, um, from the IAs who are working with my students to the um, special educators, we are constantly trying to figure out how to provide the best possible education we can under these very sort of scary um, times. And that takes a huge amount of energy. And most of us do it to, um, without um, taking care of ourselves and then sometimes without taking care of our own kids. Um, my son will still say, wait, when, when do I get a turn with all Mrs. Miller? students are dismissed. And all remaining bus rider students are dismissed. Have a nice evening, bye. And so I think Vermont teachers have shown that we actually can put an airplane together in the air while it's moving, but it does come at a cost. Um, and it comes at a cost for um, not only our mental well being, but that of our families and our students. I would say, if you wanted to know what our biggest challenge is going forward, it is the mental health of the teachers and the students. Um, our students need more um, mental help than they have ever needed before. We still have students that have kind of dropped off whose parents either sign them up for remote and they don't come or um, they're just not the same as they were before COVID. And the resources for those students are highly limited. I have had more than one turn where um, I've actually had two parents ask me in the past week for the name of a um, counselor for their child if I knew of any names. And I had to say to them, I I, here's a list. I can tell you right now, everybody's full. So even though parents are reaching out, they don't have access to what they need to have access to, um, to be able to fulfill the mental health needs of our students. And that is what is going to be our biggest challenge over the next year. Learning happens when children are fed, clothed, have shelter and feel safe. And part of that is missing right now because kids don't feel safe. COVID has made this thing that makes it so that one of their basic needs isn't being met very well right now. And what we need in the next year is, a, is to take the time to make them feel safe. And I think when we hear things like, oh, we're gonna come back on uh, in April. And I think, how is that possible? We had three classrooms with COVID cases in it in the past three days. That creates an air of unsafety to them. They came back and they were like, wait, are we coming back? Aren't we coming back? How do we know it's safe for us to be back? Our middle and high school are only at 50% capacity because it really isn't safe to have adult sized bodies in those classrooms. And when you make changes like that, that actually upsets the apple cart more because it creates an unreliability from adults because are they really gonna be able to come back? Um, I don't know. Teachers aren't being vaccinated. <laughs> Students can't be vaccinated. Um, and it's creating an air where I actually have to say from, for, for the past six months, I had my eye on a vaccination. Everything will be okay once I can be vaccinated. It, I, that, that is my safety line. That is the thing that allows me to see my mother. That is the thing that allows me to be safe. I have asthma. I am terrified of not having a vaccine. But the only way for us to come back to school altogether is to be vaccinated. And that doesn't appear to be part of the plan. And that is really what we need is mental health services <laughs> and vaccination. We don't have the supports for the kids that we need. Um, Brattleboro Retreat has closed. I don't know if you know that. That is a place where we send some of our most needy kids. What do we do with them now? Where are they going? Who's taking care of them? There is a lack of service. Um, I guess for us, we have done everything that we can. We move mountains every day and it doesn't feel like anybody has our back. It feels like we are disposable. 
It feels like we are an enemy of the state. We are a drain on the budget. We are a drain on the society of Vermont. They want to take away the pension that we give into every single paycheck. And that is why we don't invest in other things. That's part of our paycheck. I think if you want to know what we need, we, we need the state to have our back. And right now it doesn't feel like it does. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, very much appreciate your testimony. And I see, I believe that Larry is in, Larry O'Connor is in. And um, Larry, you are a special education in Middlebury Union High School, correct? Yes, I am. Thank well, you. Welcome, yeah, to the house. welcome to our Zoom closet. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm a special educator at Middlebury Union High School. I, I've been here about 16 years. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I want to start off saying, like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Um, I, am, I am in a community that really supports schools and teachers. Um, and we have an administration that has been very supportive and um I'll, I'll i'll say this i i this i think our, our i would say all of our teachers have really stepped up and we've we've done what is needed uh, in in our district in the secondary area level we're uh, we're hybrid system at the elementary school we started off with that but now they're back to five days a week um, the hybrid system, I think, is probably the best alternative we have right now. Uh, but you know, there's you know, there's there's some flaws in it. Uh, I think um, it's it's probably double the work, or or, or, or at least it's thirty percent more work. Uh, I I think I think most of the teachers now uh, work all all our weekend. Uh, I was talking to someone uh, last week, and they said, "Man, I I only worked eight hours this weekend. It, it felt really good to have a weekend off." And so, there's a um, you know we've 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 really stepped up the the uh, the hours that we're putting in, and. Uh, I also think that teachers have really learned to be more flexible and, and accommodating during this time. And uh, we're really listening to what kids have to say and what's important to them. But with all of that, you know, um, it's still like really n not enough. Um, we, we have, um, we, uh, we have a very high failure rate uh, at least in the secondary level, uh, I, I would say that most of our students uh, do not do the required work when they're on their remote days, and our remote students are, are really struggling. And I think an easy way to put it in perspective is we are in week 17 of the school year. The most I could have seen any student this year because of like the schedule would be 15 days in a class. So we're halfway through the school year and we've seen in a teacher would have seen a student a total of 15 times. Right, and so clarify a question. Are, are you yeah, saying sure. that that is for the general population or is that for students identified with special needs? Uh, that would be for the general population. So, so, so we're an AB schedule. And so if on a day you might have four four classes like maybe math history science pe and then the b day which would be tuesday you would have english art and whatever else i didn't mention uh so as a math teacher you would see those kids on monday and that's the only time that you see them and then next monday you see them again and so what we do in hybrid schedule is we have a class on monday and then we then the kids have stuff they're supposed to do on their own on uh, the remote days. And for, you know, for a certain group of kids, you know, they, they have the social emotional support at home. They have the economics where they can have a good internet system. Um, we, 
you know, are, are they live in a place that has good, has good internet, uh, you know, and, and, and they have the intellect and the executive functioning and the, you know, just the cognitive skills that, that they're persevering and they're doing okay. But if, but if, but if you think of the average 15 year old, uh, you know, you, you know, you meet with a teacher for 80 minutes and then you have roughly two hours of work for each of your classes you're supposed to do like independently. Um, that's a really heavy lift for students. Um, I, I, I know when I was 15, I would not have had the executive functioning to, to do that long-term. And so, and so what we really see is this gap is widening between, between the students. We have kids who have always done really well. They're plugging away at it. Your average students is struggling. They're falling a little bit behind. And then the kids I spend most of my day with, they're, they're falling apart. And uh, I really don't see a, a way of fixing that while COVID's going on. Um, we have some teachers will require students to zoom into class. Um, I, I spend a couple hours a week chasing kids around to figure out like why, like why they weren't zooming into the classes that they're supposed to be in. And it's, it's, it's very time consuming and we've seen little to no improvement. You have a certain percentage of the kids that just don't have internet, which we're lucky in Middlebury. It's a pretty small percent. I think in the high school, we have 17 kids with none, but you know, you, you know, you go up and ripped in parts of Cornwall, Bridport Shoreham, the, the internet's just not good. And so you're requiring these kids to be in meetings with cameras and stuff. Their, their, their internet struggles to do it. So that's not really working out. And it's certainly not working out for our low social economic students. As the economic pressures have hit uh, families, we have more and more kids are working during the week, which gets in the way of them doing their schoolwork. Uh, because they have to help out with the family. So, you know, there's all, there's all, there's all, there's all of these issues there. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's no one's fault. Like I would like, like, like I'd love to point at, you know, like, like Peter Conlin is here and he's on my school board. Like, I'd love to say like, Peter's not doing his job as a school board member, but that's not the truth. It's like, we're all, like, we're all doing the best we can. And there's so many issues here that we're really struggling. And so to me, what, what I'm starting to think about is like, what is it we need to be successful for the rest of this year? And then what is it that we're going to do in the future? And what really makes me nervous is you hear like all these talks about budget, 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 and we're going to cut, you know, and in my district, we're, we're like up against the cap but pretty much statewide, I think school budgets are a major issue. But the reality is we have maybe the top 25% of the kids are right where they're supposed to be. And then you get everyone else is really spread out and falling apart. What we really need next year is we need more teachers and we need more support. Um, you know, um, as kids fall further behind, we need more supports in place. And those supports are educators. And when we have kids who are not proficient and we're, and, and we're looking at some of them, it's, it's gonna be a year and a half of school or a year and a third of school that they've missed. Like, like that's tough. And so, so we really have to look at things to do to improve school for the next couple of years. So Larry, uh, just just to, yes. just to, to sort of focus a little bit here, um, sure. are there specific things that you would like uh, like like uh, for us to know and um, yes. to, to to address? Because we're yes. the legislature, we're not your school board. No, no, and, no, and like, but 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 I understand you're not the school board, but I but I think the state and the federal government has to come up up with a universal way of addressing these needs because I don't think the local school boards can fix this stuff. I think it's a bigger it's a bigger problem. So what are uh, what give, tell me three things that you would would like us to do? I is I this I think somehow there has to be some money found so 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 that schools can fill in the gaps that have 
been created because of this. There is, there is, there's whether it's having people come in during the summer and learning or adding more teachers, that's, that's one thing. I think more social emotional supports have to be put into schools. Uh, the local mental health agencies are maxed out and they're filled. And some, some schools have a lot of mental health services built in. Uh, others don't, but I, but I think we need to, to add, add of that. And then I, and then I also think of things that we, we can do like this year, like I, like I, I look at standardized testing. I'd like that just needs to go away until this is done. Like we know the kids are falling behind. I think adding that onto someone's plate causes too much anxiety and the students and teachers are so fragile right now that they, that they can't handle that. And, and, I, and, and when, when you look at things through a lens of students and teachers are, are just, they're emotionally raw. Every single day I come into work and I see someone crying, because whether it's a student or a faculty member, every single day this year. And, and as long as people can keep that in their mind and say, what is it that we, we can do to make the lives of these people better and easier and kind of cut out stuff. I, 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 I also think that when, that the school should focus on going into depth on things and not focus on making sure you cover all the topics. You know, like if you think back to years ago when you said like an algebra one class and then a, then geometry and then algebra two, it's like, I, I don't care if the kids get to the end of an algebra one class, I, I want them to learn something and I want them to learn it well before they go on to the next thing. Sure. But there's these motives to kind of get to at the end of, of a curriculum. A fourth grader next year is very different than a fourth grader two years ago. And we need to accept that and we need to adjust everything that we're doing. I look at next year's ninth grade class, the last time they would have been in school full-time was sixth grade. They had no full-time experience in, in middle school. They had, you know, they had a good chunk of this seventh grade year, but then after that, so you know, I'd, you know, I'm more than happy to to, to answer questions. Um, if someone wants specifics, I'm more than happy to give it. Thank you. I, I've written down uh, the things that that you were looking All for, right. and I'd like to um, move on to Chris Garros. So we have two special educators here today. Um, Chris Garros, who was here, I believe, in the in the fall, special educator from from Montpelier School District. So welcome, Chris. Hi, thanks for having me today. Sorry to join a little bit late, but I'm coming straight out of a parent meeting. So uh, happy to be here. Um, so I teach at Main Street Middle School in Montpelier, you know, not too far from the Capitol building really. And so the, the first thing I'd like to talk about is just to highlight some of the work that's that's been done. Cause I, I do think what's happened thus far uh, here in my district is amazing. But before I do that, I just want to recognize that you know, my, my opinions and experiences are mine alone. And if you talk to educators around the state as you're doing, every district has a plan that's quite different. And they've, they've had to do, do that because of um, what their infrastructure looks like, their buildings and their, their staff and what they can physically do by, uh, while being safe. So uh, just keep that in mind as I talk about Montpelier. So I would say, quite honestly, our reopening plan has been a success and really exceeded my expectations. Montpelier Roxbury, uh, from the beginning at our elementary and middle schools, when we measured out the space, uh, we made the decision over the summer that we thought we could be in person five days a week. And we've done that from the start with a shortened day. It's about two hours shorter than it would normally be because frankly, asking small children and middle school students to sit in a room all day with a mask on uh, just necessitated making the day a little shorter. And also because of some of the things that our staff is being asked to do that, that was necessary. Uh, some of the success that our district has had I, is in large, no small part because of um, the work our administration did to bring everybody to the table over the summer, make sure teachers, paraprofessionals, custodians were a part of that reopening plan. And that collaborative spirit has been there uh, throughout this pandemic, our superintendent Libby Bonesteel has been 
very uh, communicative and empathetic with our staff. And when times have been tough, uh, that's, that's really helped uh, our staff. Um, the other thing that helped is our district did uh, work with us to reach memorandums of understanding around what the working conditions were going to look like. And that helped, helped our, our teachers uh, know that they would be protected. We looked at the contract and the new working conditions and have a document that says, this, these are what things are going to look like. This, will, what ha this is what will happen if there's a case and so on. And it just helped people to know what that would look like. Um, so I, I wanna talk a little bit more about what the day looks like for our students. And I'm going to speak mostly about the elementary and middle school because I'm a middle school teacher and that's what I know. Uh, we, we work with a pod model, which you may have heard about. And so essentially what we did is we looked at all the available staff we had in the school and took every classroom and made it so there's two adults in every classroom throughout the school. Um, that pod, stays together for the whole day. And uh, they might have a teacher switch so that they can get all the middle school content they need, but that's their cohort. And we've, we've done that to mitigate risk. If we did a typical middle school day where we had kids all around the building, one case could shut us down. And uh, we, we wanted to be uh, resilient enough where if we did have a, have a case, we could have one classroom potentially go virtual, but uh, remain, remain open. And that's required a lot of flexibility in our staff. We've got specials teachers. Uh, our French teacher is now in a pod and uh, kids are supervised all day. If they go to the bathroom, an adult is following there and making sure they're not mixing groups. So we've really gone to great lengths to mitigate the risk. And uh, you know, for the most part, that, that has worked. That said, there's been a couple of really scary incidents um, one at our elementary school, which was related to the Central Vermont hockey outbreak, where we had uh, six cases in a single classroom. And that's with distancing and masks in place. And it's, it's really, uh, the Department of Health came in and said, your model is an exemplar. Um, and I, I worry about what would happen if we hadn't had that planning in place and, and had kids going about their day as normal. Um, and that, those types of incidents really wear on the staff. It, 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 I'm sure others have mentioned that, um, you know, there's, there's a cost to operating school in the way we're doing. And it is, uh, teachers are really, we're frankly quite burnt out before the pandemic, but you add this extra layer where the day looks quite different. It can be a little monotonous being in the same room all day. It, it feels a little like Groundhog Day sometimes both for our students and us. Um, and so both staff and students are, uh, it just can just feel a little monotonous. And our staff have said, we're not bouncing back from the stress in the same way we normally would. The other piece that's been difficult in this model is uh, I'm a special educator and uh, we, we've been asked to operate in this model where we mitigate risk. In a typical year, I would be all around the building in classrooms, pulling kids from different classrooms and having groups of students. But we really uh, want to be cautious that we're not potentially spreading the virus around the school. So there's two classrooms I'm physically able to go into. And if I, I can go in those classes and serve students. But um, in other cases, I have to either pull a student individually to work with them. I kind of stand at the door, say, come with me. And that way I'm not going into the room and, and potentially exposing other kids. Uh, or in some cases, I'm doing services virtually while we're in person, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm sitting in this space, which is my new office, used to be the family and consumer science kitchen, but I have a desk in here for this year, so I'm not near in my other clustered office. And I'm doing things uh, virtually with students, running writing and math groups. Uh, but it's, I'm sure as Don has said, uh, you know, any of that stuff through a computer is no substitute for in-person instruction. And uh, while I think I'm making some progress with students in that format, it's not the same as if I had kids in a, in a group from different classrooms. So I look forward to the day when I can do that again. 
but frankly, I, I don't see that happening until uh, the vaccine is a little more widespread than it is. Um, so I have that concern about really our, our tier, our multi-tiered system of supports is kind of decimated this year because our interventionists are in classrooms. I'm not in a pod, but I can't pull groups together in the same way I would like to. And uh, there's a lot of kind of asynchronous material, on-demand material created but we're really not able to, to do the in-person instruction for those second and third tiers in the ways that we would like to. And um, as Larry mentioned, that's causing a lot of kids to kind of slip through the cracks. Uh, and I, I think in terms of what we'll need, I would echo that there's going to be a lot of work to get things back, to get students where we want them to. And we're, we may need extra interventionists, uh, extra social workers to make sure kids uh, are both, you know, physically and mentally where they need to be, and then we can work on academics. And the, the other piece I'd highlight is even in our model, kids are getting about half of the uh, core instruction time that they would. We end the day two hours early, so kids might have math every other day. So um, there's going to have to be a hard look at the curriculum and what the long-term plan is to get our students where they need to be. I think amazing things are happening in the classroom this year, but we just don't have the time that we're accustomed to. And the format, frankly, is, is more challenging because we're, we're, we're remaining six feet apart. Uh, we'll also just, you know, doing what we can to, to make things somewhat fun and engaging for kids when we're, we're somewhat limited. Um, I think that's the gist of it. My, my main concern is, is, you know, we know some kids are falling behind. There's others that aren't coming to school as much as they would. And how are we going to pick up the pieces when this is all over? And the sooner we can start, um, you know, getting teachers vaccinated so that we can, even in our current model, we can do more mixing of groups than we can. You know, I think that's when things are going to be able to move forward. But uh, I'm quite impressed with how teachers are rising to the occasion, really putting their physical and mental health uh, aside to worry about their students. And uh, it's taking a toll. Well, we're, we, know, we also know there's a lot of work, work ahead that we need to do. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, we have questions and I see Representative Cooley. to find myself. <clears throat> I, I, I'm not sure you can answer this question, but I have really been for a year or so now with this COVID thing, um, very concerned about our uh, kindergarten through grade three, which I think we'll all agree are very formative years in, in the education process. Um, I, it, it's my own feeling that they have really lost um, a lot of their education uh, substance. And we, you know, these kids will continue to move on to the fourth grade, the fifth grade. And so on. how, how are we going to address that? How, how can that be addressed that, that if, the, if it can be at all, I, I don't know, but it's been a very big concern of mine to see these younger kids just continue to move on with the, with the education that they've lost. I don't know if anyone can answer that, but I, I just bring it about. It's it's very concerning to me that we continue to pass these kids through the system. Um, Maybe Stephanie? I can sort of answer that a little bit. I've worked with, you know, first grade through sixth grade. What I will say is this, I've gotten some pretty amazing kids from uh, camps outside of the United States, right? These are kids who sometimes left their country, they lose their um, first language, they start their second language. Those kindergartners, first graders and, and second graders have had it hard, but I will tell you this, they are sponges. And when you take care of all the other have healthy teachers that are in a safe space that can teach them when they are fed, clothed, and have everything they need. Once you take care of that, you can move forward and you can, you can take care of them. I'm hoping you can see me because now it says I'm unsecure or whatever. <laughs> um, they, 
Okay, they they will make up time. Our kids will make up time. What I worry about is if we are focused on catching them up without first focusing them safe and taking care of their mental needs, you will actually do more than you will do help. You've got to get them back in. You've got to create community. You've got to create safety. If you do that, then you can move forward and you will make up time. But it's, it's, if you push it, you'll overheat the system. Start with the mental health services first and making them feel safe and part of a community. Thank you. It's very helpful. Yeah, and I'll like come out. Follow up, Madam Chair. Oh, yes. Um, it, it, it's, um, would a longer school year help this out a bit? Anybody? Summertime, uh, part of the summer program. I so. it last a longer school year, Larry? Yes. Would a longer school year enable some of these younger students to catch up or um, prepare to uh, move on to another year? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure a longer school year per se. Uh, would help you know the, the the short answer is yes but then it gets like complicated but i but i i but i think giving schools the resources so they can run something during the summer for kids who have fallen behind would be a big help and then i then i also think uh refocusing on 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 what's valuable especially at the younger grades i think i think the you know if you look at like k through three it's social emotional and it's the literacy you know, if you're a strong reader, then, you know, you're going to figure school out, right? And like, if you're a strong reader, like you'll do okay in life. But if you're not a strong reader, suddenly school becomes hard, holding a job becomes hard, everything else becomes hard. So it's really kind of, I, I think, trimming away things that uh, might, might not be as important and really starting to focus on what's best for those kids. They feel safe. And you're really building on their reading in, in math and writing. Thank you. I also think class size plays into that a lot. Um, I can typically have 25, 26 kids in my room. Technically, my room is, wasn't even big enough to have that many kids in my room. So when you have 24, 25, and somebody else has 18, you get a lot more done with 18, and you can make up time. When you have 24, 25, it is a lot harder to make up time. Thank you. We've got about 25 more minutes and I've got four representatives with questions so far or, or comments and I'm going to go to Representative James and then Representative Conlon. Thanks, Chair Webb. Um, I had two different questions. I guess I'll just pick one. Um, curious about, um, I know someone earlier had mentioned standardized assessments. Um, and I'm curious to know um, how you would then quantify and try to kind of pinpoint learning loss and learning recovery needs without that data. I'd like to jump on that one. Thank you. So I think, I think what Larry's talking about is the, the, the SBAC, you know, the kind of the mandatory statewide testing. Most of our schools, are, I know our, ours does, have local assessments that we've administered where we know which kids are struggling in reading and math. And for me personally, this is an opinion, the SBAC data doesn't get us that information as quickly. So, you know, we do that test sometime between March and May, and then we see the results, you know, in summertime. So, and it also takes about a week to administer. And I've already highlighted the shortened day that we have. So you're talking about eating up a week of already a shortened school year to administer a test when in my opinion, we already have local assessments that tell us which kids are struggling. We administer those three times a year. So I think it's a case of, uh, you know, each school and district should have a way to tell which kids are struggling, but the SBAC this year is probably not the tool to do that and, and probably counterproductive in that it will eat up precious time. Thank you. Thank you. Kate, did we hear earlier that that's a federal requirement though? Can the 
Can we do nothing about that, the SBAC? I, I, I have a feeling we're going to be hearing something about that coming from the okay. federal government with the new secretary. Um, that's definitely a conversation that's happening at, at a pretty much national level. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Representative Arison, I think, what's next, and then Representative Austin. Thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, question for our presenters, uh, and, and I'm going to prefix that with, with a comment. Uh, Pre-session, we had a uh, session with HCRS, which is the Mental Health Services in Southeast Vermont. And one thing that will come, and they provide some of the services to our school, and they uh, emphasized very strongly that there was not staff available, not uh, not just plain not available. And what my question to the presenters is, if these mental health services that are so dire in need of, are they going to be, of, uh, do you have staffing that can accomplish that? This might be a question for the principals, but what, why not to see what the teachers have to say? Yeah. I, I'll just I would touch say that. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Stephanie, and I've talked to a number of folks that that is one of the concerns of the designated agencies that they they don't have enough counselors on staff now, and when we see the heightened demand, and um, when we talk about we address the issues of truancy and who's who's going to go out there and find students, and as Larry said, that's incredibly time consuming to find students who aren't engaged. So it it definitely is an issue that we have to address. And in absence of additional staff, then we have to take a real district-wide approach to, to solving those problems. As Chris mentioned, you know, looking at the MTSS, th that will need to be revised. Multi you know, to, to figure out. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the jargon. Yes. Yeah, we, we, I'm really trying because, as you know, we have got a lot of letters in this field. <laughs> um, Let's see, Representative uh, uh, Larry, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to comment on that. Comment on that. I, I'm in a little bit of a unique situation. I think uh, my my uh, district uses an outside agency. My wife uh, is a therapist, or should say, social worker in a different district, and they hire them. They don't use an outside agency. Uh, they 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 do use an outside agency for some stuff, but uh, they have several of these staff uh, that are there for social emotional and it's a social work position. Um, these outside agencies, the amount of paperwork you have to do that it's, that it's equivalent of two work days per month of paperwork. And plus there's other like requirements and training they have to do where schools, because of uh, how Medicaid is done, it's, it's significantly less paperwork. So it, so, so it costs more than using these outside agencies but you get a lot of bang for your buck. My, my wife is in a high school. I, I think she has 70 to 80 kids that she checks in with on, on a regular basis. And she's not as overwhelmed as I am. So I think it's working pretty well. <clears throat> Thank well, you. The good, the good news is my, my daughter's working on her master's in that field. And I keep encouraging her to, and I said, boy, you're going into a field. You're going to be able to write your own ticket. Yeah, that's great to hear, John. Um, Sarita Austin and then Representative Wills Williams. I'm just wondering if you all have like a dedicated planning time in a um, team time, in addition to planning and lunch, if you have a dedicated time to meet with other teachers that share groups of students. Well, could that, does that happen on the Wednesday, let's say when students aren't in school on a regular basis? Um, right now, nobody shares students, first of all, because you can't, you can't mix your pot. Our kids don't eat lunch together. They stay in our room. They don't go to recess together. But I do, we team, we um, use um, all day Wednesday to plan as a team. Um, we meet together. Um, we've never been more in sync because we've never had time. Um, usually we're trying to check, you know, catch each other, you know, bathroom and, um, you know, in between lunch for five minutes of calm together. So that has been one highlight to this year is that Wednesday more age than we have. And unfortunately, when we go back next year, that's not going to be there. 
for mm -hmm. us, we, we end the day two hours early and that's when we have those, those meetings and our planning time. Um, and there are kind of curricular meetings happening. I participate on a math team. One day I'm with the language arts teachers. Um, I think what's, what's missing is I'm not able as easily to keep tabs on some of my students and how they're doing in their core classes because I can't go in there. Mm -hmm. And there's been less time to do that kind of informal, hey, this student's not getting any other work done. Can you help out with that? Um, but we, we do have team time and it's why we end the day early. Good. So uh, we, we have a collaborative prep at, at the high school within departments. So like the English department has collaborative prep and then teachers also have, have uh, some prep throughout the week. Uh, the traditional prep time, depending on what position you have, like, so like in my position, it's, it's a lot less prep and it's a lot more like chasing kids and families around, but uh, it's, we've been very fortunate with, with the collaborative prep in, 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 in our district and we've been lucky to maintain that, so. Thank you. So. Representative Brady. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for joining us today, Stephanie and <clears throat> Chris and Larry. Um, I guess I'll, I'll chime in a little bit sort of with a question, but also thoughts and experience as a teacher as well. Um, that it, it, what I'm hearing from this and having had been able to hear the testimony of other groups as well, some of the principals I think did a particularly good job of kind of weaving together all of what has happened and the challenges. Um, is that teachers are sort of in survival mode right now, like navigating in some cases, things continue to change as there are cases and classes shut down um, and, and continuing to just teach in this altered challenging territory. And so as we as a committee, as a state, as a nation think about recovery and re-engagement, um, clearly just doing business as usual, going back to school, following the calendar as usual, um, you know, one or two in-service days, boom, we reopen, we reset the rosters as if nothing had happened is, is not going to, um, at most my fear is that is that is what will, will happen and that's not going to um, address the issues that everyone is raising here. So um, though I'm not sure we've heard a total succinct ask or, or and I don't know yet learning as a legislator what our role even is as the state to me, it sounds a lot like there are there are time issues, there are resource issues um, uh, in order to, to do this thoughtfully. I appreciate the, the comments about class size and I think we're in a difficult position there. I, I've noticed it myself. I think some of my classes are faring quite okay because they're so small. I have six or seven kids in a section because they're split across two days or two parts of the week of the alphabet. And so despite the distancing and the masks and the awkwardness, we're able to have a pretty social atmosphere and talking and things. And um, obviously we cannot afford, taxpayers cannot afford those kind of class sizes, but it has been a really interesting, um, you know, 201, every time I've surveyed all my classes, kids have said, you know, what's, what are the good things? We love smaller classes. <laughs> we love having smaller classes. Um, and, and for all the students who are in school and notably we have lost a lot of students, which has gotta be one of our top priorities, but for those who are in school, teachers are able to be more in tune to them this year because of those um, class size numbers. Again, I, I know that's a, you know, those, we have small class sizes to begin in Vermont. So <laughs> even smaller class sizes is not a realistic solution on the horizon, but I think it's interesting, pretty universal anecdotal, or I should say anecdotal, not universal evidence this year of what, we, what we've experienced. I guess I'm curious from the NEA, if you have any other kind of thoughts about really what it, what it will take to recover and re-engage and not just start business as usual, you know, the, the when last, second to last Wednesday in August. Um, and knowing that, you know, teachers are, are we're, we're very accustomed to a school schedule and summer's off and a break and often kind of plan our lives around that. Um, and so, you know, I think it will be, we be delicate if we're talking about needing some of that time, clearly it would need to be compensated, but um, but I, I wonder how the NEA and teachers are thinking about um, how to do this well and not just do it. 
Right, and we've, we've just started meeting around that as, as education groups with the AOE. Uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher has uh, created the re a draft of a recovery plan, and I think those ideas is, are will be percolating over the next few weeks. I do think we have to be cautious in not having it you know, fixed by September. I think that's one of the um, issues that we're facing. That this is this this recovery is is not going to happen over the summer. It's not going to happen before Christmas of next year. Um, I also think one of the um, things that I've learned at this at, from the state level is that you know, and, and Chris alluded to this, that there's um, every school district is different. The experience of teachers, even within a district, are very different. Uh, and um, I think we we need to take, you know, a state approach, but also a regional and district by district approach. Just one example, um, I've met with uh, Jeff Francis and Jay Nichols, Superintendent Association, Principals Association, with uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher uh, for a couple of times now on the truancy issue. And I think as an example of like, let's look at this issue, define what it is, what are some of the solutions to this, and then here are the resources we need, here's a plan for that. So it's almost like issue by issue, region by region, and I, you know, and, and we're all in sort of a rush to get it done, but I think that's what it's going to take so that we, as we always do as educators, right, student-centered, figure out the resources are, um, and plan, we, and, and do that. The, the the challenge is going to be finding the time to do that. And, um, and, and we have to build it in. I think as Stephanie mentioned, you know, having the, the Wednesday time uh, is important. We've, we've struggled with that. You know, I taught for 31 years. That was always the struggle, you know. So I hope that addresses your concern. But it's going to, and it's going to take, you know, from school board superintendents, principals, educators, um, as as well as political leadership in the AOE. Thank you. I have a question to the special educators, and this is something that I have heard. You know, in special ed law, there's something called compensatory education, where students that have have been uh, denied or have not made progress, which is considered the basically that the school hasn't provided the correct, you know, the appropriate services. And then there's COVID related learning loss. And my understanding is um, that there's a there's there's a maybe a difference between the agency and the federal law that's looking at whether we're counting this as compensatory education and an increase in workload um, paperwork. Are you finding that? Have you experienced that based on requirements from the AOE? Uh, uh, go. go ahead, Larry. You, you, you. you, you I can go. <laughs> okay, so I, I would say uh, better lately at the start of the pandemic we were asked to create these distance learning plans. And then there were about three or four different revisions to said distance learning plans that resulted in me, really the first thing I had to do was be on the phone around paperwork when I wanted to be uh, planning how I was going to do distance learning. You know, at the start of this year, our district came up with a, with a system and we, we put some things in the IEP where there's a contingency plan in case we need to go virtual. And that's working better. Uh, hypothetically, if we did go virtual for a week or two, I don't think I would need a paperwork make, need to make a paperwork change. It hasn't happened yet, uh, and I've heard conflicting information around that. So, in short, it started with a lot of different paperwork changes. Frustratingly, so I think it's improved. But uh, if I go virtual and find out otherwise, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Larry? Yeah, I, I would I would echo that. Uh, my spring in the first month of this year um, was paperwork. And that's all that, that, that it was. The amount of paperwork that was required was uh, was was just this enormous. I, I, I truly can't describe it. It, 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 it was so much. Uh, but uh, 
so far, what we were promised is that these contingency plans would actually save paperwork. I would say from probably end of October, beginning to November, my, my paperwork is now kind of what it is in a normal year. Um, I have not had to go remote yet, nor has um, students in other high schools, so I can't speak to that. But in theory, I, I, I just got to put a note in the IEP and then, and then we're all set. I, I, the compensatory services, um, I, I, I don't feel I, I can adequately speak to the uh, law because I've, I, I've heard it change, but I can assume that there's going to be compensatory services for kids who are on IEPs. And I think for kids who have severe learning disabilities, we, we should expect that. And I think in the elementary schools, we should. I think uh, when it gets to middle school and high school, that usually translates to kids coming in in the summer and they tend to push back against their parents more. So I'm not so sure you'll see a significant increase in, in that because the kids have to be willing to, so. I'd like to speak to that one a little bit too. So compensatory services generally means there was something in an IEP that somebody didn't do and we have to make up for it. Then there's also, uh, ESY extended school year, that's generally provided to a student that shows regression after a long period without instruction. Um, you know, we bring them in in the summer to really maintain skills. And then the states added the third wrinkle, which is the, the COVID uh, services. How you differentiate those three things, I, I don't know, but those conversations are probably going to start to happen. And, um, you know, I haven't seen a lot of guidance on how to differentiate them or what that's going to look like as we approach the, the summer. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions here. Um, we are going to be uh, continuing to stay in touch with the NEA and with the teachers as we're moving forward. Um, next week, I'm hoping that we're gonna have an opportunity to look at uh, how the state might be moving forward in addressing uh, learning loss and um, what's the term we're using now? Not learning loss. Well, some folks are using disruptive learning. Reengagement. 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 Re Thank you. I, I got to split this up. I don't know why I can't remember that <laughs> that word. But another phrase that folks yeah. are using is unfinished learning. Yes, I've heard right. that as well. So, and we want to make sure that we in 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 all of this that we don't have any sense of punishment of students for being behind and we know that children often feel that that they're being punished and i think that's one of the things that we that we absolutely you know must make sure that we don't it it is not their fault it is no one's fault right this pandemic is no one's fault and we need to keep that in mind as as i'm sure all of you will but as we as we get into that rush right We've got to, get them, got to get them caught up. Um, we ask the question when, when someone says, my child is behind, we want to say, behind what, right? Behind, and because and, there are millions of students in the, in the country in the same situation. So. Well, as you know, we're the state and we're here to help. We're the legislature, we're here to help. Yes, and so we appreciate that. We, we, we sincerely, I, when I speak with my counterparts from around the country, I genuinely appreciate the support our education system has from state leadership that, that we enjoy that and they don't in other states. So thank you. Thank you. We know that our students are learning. We just aren't sure what they're learning is, but we wish they were learning. <laughs> um, they have active brains. Thank you so much, everybody.